<laughs> One other point I had, which is that he wrote a humor book, I think pre Da Vinci Code, under the pseudonym Danielle Brown, called 187 Men to Avoid, A Survival Guide for Romantically Frustrated Women. Just another, it's psychodynamically speaking, <laughs> baffling and intriguing thing to have done with his time. <laughs> yeah, if there's anyone I want to listen to about how human behavior works, it's Dan Brown, writing as a woman. <laughs> well, yeah, he's writing as a woman woman to women so it's probably just advice that points towards guys like him right like, ladies stop throwing yourself <laughs> yourselves at you know jerks throw yourselves at guys who maybe know a lot of trivia maybe guys who think a little bit outside the box you know <laughs> guys with a more esoteric world view <laughs> yeah honestly so okay so that other podcast that i was telling you about they do their breaks by reading three items from this book like three of the types of men and the one i heard it was like oh a, a red flag is a guy who's handsome <laughs> <laughs> that absolutely rules. <laughs> the worse the degree of kyphosis in their upper back, <laughs> the more intriguing and possibly sensual you may find them to be. <laughs> George Bush doesn't care about black people. Our ed education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and... We sitting here, I supposed to be the franchise player, and we in here talking about practice. It's Britney, bitch. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Oh, surely! Our next door neighbors are foreign countries. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Hey, what's up? How's everybody doing? Yeah. Shufflers, what are we remembering <laughs> this week? This all started from Kyle, right? Like Ben and I never had any intention of ever talking about Dan Daniel Brown. Nor should you have. It's, it was a genius idea because, like, we could do a four-part series on on Dan Brown. Like, this episode is going to go six hours long. They tried to do that in movie form. It actually didn't pan out that well. Right. They tried to make a TV show recently, right? I think on The Lost Symbol. And I think so. Yeah. Is that Did that come out? Did anyone watch that? It did. It, it was an Amazon show. I have a separate podcast about the show. <laughs> where I review every episode. <laughs> episode by episode. Breaking actually, down the dense symbology for all the viewers. <laughs> so in preparation for this podcast, I went out and I listened to some Dan Brown podcasts, which do exist. There's one called the, the Dan Brown Code. Some of it was good, but they're like nerds. And so they talk a lot about word choice. They're like, oh, he used sepulchrous twice in this chapter. And I think he's overdoing it. <laughs> like, you nerds. <laughs> how about you talk about, I don't know, like how stupid everything else is. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> of all of the problems with Dan Brown's writing, the word choice probably doesn't break top <laughs> this is a this is a man who can't describe a v at one point in the book he's like this was the old symbol for man and they print an upside down v it's they do the same thing with the letter m <laughs> i didn't i wasn't able to finish the book because it was so bad and i dragged my feet for so long giordano and i we just took the hit <laughs> oh I, angels and demons is so much i mean we'll get into it but like it's it's so much worse in a way like i thought it was actually the better of the two like that's kind of how i remember them being but it's like it's really a lot cruder and i have some great quotes from that one but yeah ben i mean kyle suffered the most brain damage from this i mean <laughs> you've listened to like inferno and get the law symbol and what are you trying yeah. are, you, are you spiraling out of control like what's <laughs> yeah, what, yeah why it's, <laughs> what, well, why it, did you do this it started it started with i i got used to like falling to sleep to stuff but like sometimes when you listen to something that's good you know it, you you want to keep listening so at some point i was like okay dan brown da vinci code haven't read it since like 2003 i'll give it a shot as my like, falling to sleep book and then i realized that it was extremely effective because despite the stakes being constant constantly high there's actually nothing of importance whatsoever <laughs> occurring at any given time and so I found that I could put it on and within like eight minutes fall asleep so I basically listened to all of the Dan Brown books in 
I would say 10 to 20 minute chunks over the course of like nine to 10 months. And because I'd fall asleep and leave a, a timer on every night, I'd have to go back to find where I fell asleep over. Oh. And so I listened to like, there are probably sections that I listened to like four times before I finally made it fast. And that's probably where the deep brain damage set in. I think you're probably fine. Cause like, you know how Rasputin would take tiny doses of arsenic to like slowly become <laughs> into it. Maybe that's kind of what you were doing. Yeah. I, I thought reading this was like the literary intellectual equivalent of having cholera. Like I just took a little bit and it just emptied me. Like it, it went, it went right through me and it, it dragged parts of me outside of me with it. I read American Psycho at the same time that I was reading these books. I was kind of like flipping back and forth. And like American Psycho, it's, it's one of those books where you put it down and then you find yourself like thinking about what the author meant or what, like what was intended for, by that. There's like a, a sort of like level of analysis that's sort of necessary with it because it's it's very like abstract. And But the experience of reading a Dan Brown book is like completely visceral, right? Like the feelings you get are like fear, curiosity, like gratification from information being revealed to you. And so the best comparison I have is, you know how babies don't experience object permanence so you can play peekaboo with them that's what reading this book is like it's like having someone cover your eyes and then remove them yes. over and over again <laughs> it's extremely accurate there's just there there's no subtext whatsoever there's no lines to read between which is ironic considering what the book is about my favorite dan brownism is few people realized that when they were doing blank they were actually making a reference to blank <laughs> Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Let's let, let's focus up. Why are we doing this? From our like more macro perspective of looking at the 2000s as the decade, I think this is the last book that I remember everyone reading. Everyone's dad or uncle read this book. And it's the last book that I think really had this tremendous imprint on popular culture until maybe like Fifty Shades of Grey in the next decade would be like kind of the next equivalent. Even but that, only women like kind of read that as much. <laughs> it, it's hard to overstate how insanely popular this book was. People had Da Vinci Code fever. The Da Vinci Code spent 28 weeks in the number one spot on the New York Times bestseller list. It sold 80 million copies and a half-hearted movie, which nobody liked, grossed over $700 million, <laughs> meaning it was the 24th highest grossing movie of the entire decade. Again, a movie nobody liked. It was just under Spider-Man 2. <laughs> Everyone had a copy. Uh, there was only one book in the entire decade that actually sold more copies than this. It's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. The Bible. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people don't know this, but Bible is actually ancient Greek for the book. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've been reading too much Dan Brown. I need to break off from the natural conversation and narrative of the pod to read a fucking Wikipedia etymology. <laughs> so, well, it's, it's interesting you bring up Harry Potter because I think that is the big difference is Harry Potter had like huge mass appeal. And I think a lot of adults were reading it and enjoying it, but feeling a little bit, a little bit sheepish that they're reading a kid's book and liking it so much. And everyone's primed like Harry Potter. Like there's been lineups at the bookstores for the first time in, I don't know. I don't even know if people lined up for book for book like midnight book launches before Harry Potter. Yeah. So everyone's primed for that. And then boom, Dan Brown comes out with this. And finally, it's something that every adult can say, ah, this one's for me and feel smart, <laughs> even if it's in the most <laughs> superficial <laughs> sense while reading it. And I, and that I don't think you're right. I don't think that's happened since. Like what, ha what has there been for a, like the general like adult population that has been this popular? Not, not, this is probably the first and last book episode we're ever going to do on this pod. Because yeah, books just don't. Well, we're we're to gonna do Harry Potter like, at some point. I mean, we have to. As much oh. as you hate it, I mean, you can't hate yeah. it more than this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a toss up, honestly. <laughs> but I feel like a book to become like a big hit back then, it, it kind of had to be scandalous in some way. Like even Harry Potter had like an anti religious band. Fifty Shades of Grey definitely had like a, ooh, it was like taboo. And this had a, a lure of taboo to it as well. Super yeah. quaint looking back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and at the time, then at the time, this was scandalous. But let's just do like a little uh, point of view for, for all of us. What was the first time you read this book? Tell me a little bit about like what was going on. And yeah, I actually did not read it as a, as a child. My my parents, I told my parents I wanted to pick it up and they were like, don't, don't read that. Don't. And I think, I don't think they were doing it because they thought it was bad. I think they're like, we don't want you reading this stuff that's so critical of religion or whatever. But uh, also, I think they also knew it was bad. And honestly, I'm glad they prevented me from reading this because I think 14 year old me would have just devoured this hook, line and sinker. I think it would have had a profound effect on you because like even today, you're the closest of the three of us to being a symbolo symbologist. <laughs> Is that <Yeah>. the job? <laughs> 
not a it's not a field <laughs> and what's funny is like many things with dan brown he is almost correct in that like there's a field called semiotics which is about the relationship between the signifier and the sign or the signified which is about the study of signs but it's like he's so wrong while being in the ballpark of almost correct it's it's amazing truly well well real uh brown heads <laughs> will know that uh, robert landon does teach you an undergrad introductory course on semiotics so <laughs> kyle how about you when did you read this book for the first time oh yeah i read it when it came out and i think like as being a 13 year old it definitely got me a blinded sinker i remember this book blowing my mind when i was reading it like i i can remember sitting up in my room at night and like turning the pages and as the puzzles came and as the clues came and as the the pieces of conspiracy drip in being like holy Holy shit and really feeling like I was like waking up to something yeah I was I was in Italy I think uh when I read both of like both Da Vinci Code and Vengeance of Demons and like I'm still like I don't like anything scary and it's it was very spooky <laughs> you know <laughs> but when, I remember when I read Angel and Demons like I thought that I understood how God and the universe existed I was like oh God is energy and he converted himself into matter so that like all of this could exist and like as a 13 year old I thought I had discovered something and then even with the Da Vinci Code you're like oh this makes sense like in the, the, the <laughs> GM, right oh yeah I can <laughs> I can picture going up to the kitchen and being like hey mom <laughs> Did you know that the Catholic Church has been keeping like, all of this under wraps for centuries, millennia? And my mom just being like, okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's great, Kyle. You know, kind of blows my mind when you find out Dan Brown got divorced in 2019 due to infidelity. You can't imagine him wanting to fuck that much. But his wife claims that the web of lies that he told to cover his tracks were as intricate as the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> da Vinci Code's <laughs> yes! <laughs> First off, first off, honey, I was pursuing the divine feminine, so you can't be mad at me. I was bringing Second all things off. into balance. I'm just imagining him coming and yelling, the divine feminine! <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love the idea of Dan Brown telling his wife about his infidelity via code, just leaving, <laughs> leaving a riddle on the table. But again, it's a riddle a seven-year-old could solve. <laughs> yeah, she, she's showing him pictures that like a private investigator took of Dan Brown like cheating. And he's like, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, doggy style refers to the way that dogs have sex. <laughs> Not a lot of people are thinking about that. Uh, so fun, fact about that. Thinking about that. <laughs> fun fact about private investigators, uh, the term gumshoe refers to uh, the... Robert, I want a divorce. Or Dan, I want a divorce. You know, most people don't know when they use the word divorce, <laughs> what they're actually invoking. Robert, I found this crypt text in your room and I opened it by putting in the word bust. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I like the idea that he keeps a journal that that like you know details his his sexual indiscretions, but he's writing it backwards and thinking she'll never crack it. <laughs> and he's just shocked when he realizes that most people can in fact read things backwards yeah. <laughs> just by looking at them, but Robert couldn't. Yeah, she reads his message backwards, and and he's like, "You're you're in the Illuminati." <laughs> She's like, no, Robert, I used a mirror. <laughs> in his defense, he may lack object permanence, and it's entirely possible. <laughs> that when his wife is not in the room he forgets that she exists <laughs> how did you find me did you hire a hashashin it's like no i found your condoms <laughs> you've left them in your travel bag <laughs> so just i'm sure most people don't remember what the book was about or maybe they were lucky enough to have never read it in the first place but uh just to give a little recap here so in 2000 dan brown publishes angels and demons and it's a story about a harvard symbologist who is brought in as a subject matter expert to help solve a murder a murder which were only the tip of the iceberg into a thriller much larger in scope uh, and then he published the da vinci code which had the same plot and that blew up and it sort of popularized both books so let's start with the da vinci code uh robert langdon is woken up in the middle of the night uh because there's been a murder of the louvre's curator Jacques Saunier. and as the curator was dying he left a series of clues in blood and invisible ink that would allow his yeah, granddaughters <laughs> that would allow just, his just what a normal guy would do <laughs> 
Yeah, and the book makes clear he is shot in the gut. Stomach acid is leaking out. He's got, and he knows because he's a veteran of the French-Algerian War that it is an excruciatingly painful and slow way to go. So he leaves an intricate series of clues. This stuff is all explained uh, in the book. I mean, he's the leader of the Priory of Silent. He has these anagrams ready to go. It's not like he comes up with them. Okay, it's totally realistic, all right? And the stuff's shitting on the book. <laughs> So anyway, these clues, like he, he's he's putting these clues so that his granddaughter, Sophie, who's a police cryptographer, and Robert Langdon can find out an ancient secret that he's holding, which is that Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a child together, and that Sophie and the curator are the descendants of that child. Uh, so this info that Jesus had a kid is actually what the Holy Grail is. The Grail is a vessel for Jesus's blood, which is to mean his descendants, not a physical cup. So this bloodline yeah. has been kept a secret by a secret society called the Priory of Sion for 2,000 years. And the members of the Priory include people like Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, and the curator of the museum that was murdered. However, the Catholic Church, specifically a radical branch called the Opus Dei, are also on the hunt for this information to keep it hushed up. One of their acolytes, Silas, is who murders the curator attempting to get the information. So there's a race between Robert Langdon, Silas, uh, which is the main tension of the story, but there's another layer of intensity, which is to add the police as sort of a third conspirator. And so now there's a race between the police, Robert, and Silas around Paris and London. I mean, doesn't that sound like fun? So in the end, Robert's good friend, who's an atheist, betrays Robert and is revealed to be the one pulling the strings, fooling the Catholic Church into doing its bidding. He wants to reveal that Jesus had a kid to destroy the Catholic Church. I don't know, it makes sense for some reason. (laughs) In the end, Robert Langdon wins and he decides to keep it a secret because uh, religion helps people or something. (laughs) Oh, I should say that last part like it all all of the secrets being revealed to Robert Langdon who then does nothing with it is literally how every book ends every single book ends with him accruing more secret ancient knowledge and then choosing to tell no one and do nothing and uh essentially make no meaningful impact or change whatsoever right so essentially the outcome of the world is the same as if like he had died step one into his journey all right let's first talk about his writing style okay so as we mentioned he has these extremely short short chapters, which always end on a cliffhanger, even when the next chapter is going to start the very next word in the conversation. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> that's 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 a that's a particularly amazing Dan Brownism. Yeah, that, oh yeah. that knack I, for, for ending a chapter at the end of the sentence and the same person continue the next <laughs> sentence. <laughs> I almost had a stroke when I turned the page and on the left page it said chapter 59 and on the right page it said chapter 60. (laughs) How dare you? How dare you, Dan Brown? I will give him, as part of his writing style, he's very good at creating grisly, scary scenes. When you walk into the Louvre at night, and there's like a naked, contorted body on the floor with its blood everywhere. I was like, this this is spooky. And I, I can appreciate that. The, yeah, I, I also, I got to give him credit. The opening sequence in, in Da Vinci Code is probably the peak. Silas entering, we don't really know what's going on, but he's shooting Sonier. And we know Sonier's got some mission he has to do as he's bleeding out. That's that's a, a glorious way to start what is ultimately a terrible, terrible book. It is his, <laughs> it's like, it's Dan Brown's masterpiece for sure, right? Like it's his uh, magnum opus. Yes. They are all worse than this. <laughs> I, I can say that with a certain degree of authority. Obligatory magnum opus day. Magnum opus day. <laughs> <laughs> and a magnus opus day to you. <laughs> Yeah, I have, a, I have a couple examples of the Dan Brown writing. As we've said, just the, the perspective is third person limited narration. So you have these different point of view characters. And I guess Dan Brown needs to incorporate Wikipedia fun facts, not even related to the insane conspiracy theory. Like it's one thing to be like, did you know Friday the 13th is ominous because that's when all the Knights Templar were killed by the Catholic Church? Okay, I roll, but that is at least related to his stupid tapestry conspiracy theory. But what's especially funny is Anytime he has to describe a building, his third person limited narration just comes off as someone who's not not all right in the head. But he says the exact length, if Langdon recalled correctly, was around 1500 feet, the length of three Washington monuments laid end to end. Equally breathtaking was the corridor's width, which easily could have accommodated a pair of side by side passenger trains. The center of the hallway was dotted by the occasional statue or colossal porcelain urn, which served as a tasteful divider and kept the flow of traffic moving down one wall and up the other. Is this how you think about big hallways when you go in there? How many trains could fit in here? <laughs> how many trains are in Dan Brown's house? That's what I want to know. <laughs> (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> What's the over under? I'm saying six six six. <laughs> the same as the number of glass panes on the on the pyramid. <laughs> so it's just about to, that's actually one of my like favorite examples of an again the random facts being shoehorned in. He's describing the you know the big glass pyramid at the Louvre, and he says after uh, that you know the French detective whose last name is just Fash, which is hilarious. Yes! Another, <laughs> another Dan Brownism. All the names are hilarious. He wondered if Fash had any idea that the pyramid was made up of exactly 666 panes of glass. Conspiracy buffs claimed it was the number of the devil. Langdon decided not to bring it up. <laughs> so, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> We're just being privy to random. Like He's wondering if he knew. <laughs> Uh, and that's, that's almost that you're right that's a shoehorn because he's not yes. even saying it out loud <laughs> no. we're just it's and like i love the idea of dan brown just being like ah they're gonna love another another you know peek behind the curtain that is robert langdon's brilliant mind <laughs> <laughs> the, the other one that he leans on so much is any building that is narrow in any way, Robert Langdon has to point out, huh, pretty crude reference to a phallus, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As if yes. that's like a really deep symbolic observation to make. Yes. And I love that he links it up with French masculinity at several points. It's like the French, you know, with their complexes and their leaders of diminutive stature, love a phallic building. <laughs> So if, the, if that's um, everything you guys have about the, the authorship of the books, I'll just start with my first topic here, which is something that I think Dan Brown is really, really good at, especially if you have like a bird brain like you do at 13 years old, which is the, these liminal spaces between fact and fiction. And so the book is so full of fun facts that he does a great job of bleeding them into the conspiracy. And so it's impossible to tell which parts are real and, and then which part are the book's lore, because it, it's like you've been boiled like a frog with the water slowly heating up right like the knights templar bits which transitions at some point from true historical fact to insane conspiracy theories and you're like oh I, for I forgot where exactly i should stop taking this as fact mary magdalene for example wasn't a prostitute i didn't know this and then you know oh she she's the one sitting in jesus's right and it's like, okay maybe. so like the first one is a, is a fact the second one is like oh maybe that's a fact okay and then like by the time you get to step 56 <laughs> And it's like, oh yeah, the Priory of Siron are, are, are protecting the, the Holy Grail. You're like, oh shoot, was, was step 33 the lie? Was it step three? It's, it's a really like effective writing style, I find. And only sometimes can you catch him lying. <laughs> and I remember one of the ones, that, one of the boldest lies that he goes for in the books was, he, he's talking about eating the Eucharist. I think he was going off about how Christianity adapted a lot of pagan symbolism. And so he goes, oh, you know, Christians knew that they were eating the Eucharist, but did they know that it was actually an influence of the Aztec practice to make that tradition more palatable <laughs> to the conquered what? Aztecs. And I'm like, I that's not true. Unfortunately for Dan Brown, time is linear. So that, 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 that timeline doesn't work. Yeah, and I think when it comes to these like conspiracy theories, it's worth stressing. Dan Brown in interviews says the only fictional part of the book is Robert Langdon. He says everything else is entirely true. And the ways in which he can be so wrong in the ballpark of being right, like Mary Magdalene the church calling her a whore way after the fact that is true you know what else is true she's a literal catholic saint <laughs> there are like churches built to her she wasn't defamed to make her less prominent or prevalent or like my favorite one in terms of you know being wrong in the in the most like closest to right kind of way is uh, he quotes the gospel of philip a gnostic gospel where that says mary magdalene was jesus's companion and sophie in the book says well companion doesn't mean you know partner and uh, the british guy whose name has tea in it <laughs> tea, tea bag or whatever <laughs> old professor tea bag it's like well any aramaic scholar will tell you that companion meant wife so i looked up because i was curious no it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> It's just like not true. And B of all, the Gospel of Philip is not written in Aramaic, it's written in Coptic, and the Coptic is a translation from Greek. So the book has two connections to two different languages, neither of which are Aramaic. <laughs> and the Aramaic scholar would tell you, and you're reading is like, damn, he knows about Aramaic. This guy knows his stuff. And also when when T Bing says that, it literally just goes, She looked at Robert, who shrugged and went, He's right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an excellent way to double down and cover up your lie. Have one character say it, and then have the other character immediately go, yep. 
<laughs> you're totally right that the genius is having all the stuff that is either right or certainly feels right when you're reading it, bumping right up against it. But and, and like, I don't know, I guess I have to give him some credit. But I think I remember, again, being like 13 or however old I was when this came out. And like, he was the first time I ever read about like the Catholic Church deliberate suppression of like women's roles and the like erasing of like traditional roles and like, I don't know, tying it into all the pagan and nature worship and all that stuff. And that stuff you read and you're like, oh, whoa. And, you know, it makes sense. And I think it's largely accurate. But yeah, then it just blurs at some point and it is impossible to tell. And the, the description of being like the frog in the boiled water is totally correct because you're just by the time you can step back and look at it, you're already too deep in it. You're like, yep, I'm along for the ride. Yeah. Also, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say this one thing about like accuracy business or whatever is like, uh, there's no such thing as paganism. That's like capital P paganism. There were so many different kinds of religion back in the ancient world. Sorry, I am putting putting my little subject expert hat on very briefly. But like, I, I totally get that he wants to stress the church's role in establishing patriarchy. But pre-Christian Romans and Greeks and Egyptians and all of them were patriarchal as fuck. <laughs> the Romans didn't give their daughters names. <laughs> like, they didn't think they were worth naming. Every Roman dude has three names. Like your given name, your family name, and your nickname that becomes part of your name. But the women were just given like a whatever family name. That's why they're all called Julia or like Agrippina or whatever, whatever, whatever. That's a um, yikes from me, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a whole cottage industry, I remember, that popped up around like, debunking the Da Vinci Code. It was like every like uh, local news station, I remember, had like, a, a little field day where they were like, oh, we looked at some of the stuff that said the Da Vinci Code. And I feel like nobody cared. It's like, nerd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are the problem. You're trying to suppress the information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I feel like as a 13 year old, I was like, oh, the Catholic Church strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> the PR this, machine this goes all the way to the top <laughs> I'm sure there was a sermon at some point. I can't remember any because I never listened to any of the Catholic sermons. But I, I had, Ben, you recall like ever being in a mass where they talked about the Da Vinci Code? No, I think their the strategy was just to ignore it. Especially like if you're in like a, if you're in the suburbs of North America, like you're probably hanging on by a thread as a Catholic <laughs> church. Don't, don't take away something people like. Right. People like this book, right? It's, it's the same reason the church has always been very, has always positioned itself very gingerly around Harry Potter. It's like, oh, the thing that made my kid read, you want to take away the one <laughs> thing that, that got my kid to read a book you're gonna take that away from me okay so yes yeah, so actually so this is a good jumping off point um for talking about how the book helps helps us understand the decade and and what what was it about this novel that made it so appealing to audiences at the time and like what can it tell us about the culture at the time and religious controversy i think is like the central element of like what made this book popular and why it was tantalizing why it was taboo and religious controversy was like a much bigger deal in the 2000s it's it's hard to imagine now but the cancel culture of the day was sort of largely rooted on the conservative side. So you could be canceled for like not supporting the war in Iraq or like even offending the Catholic Church, which seems to be such an antiquated idea. But part of the reason why the book was so popular was its controversy. I feel like most people heard about this book because it was making a stink about religion, which of course just led to it becoming more popular. Yeah, and, and specifically, like this would have been only, I think like a year or two after a lot of the big scandals, like the sex abuse scandals were really blowing up and really becoming mainstream. So it wasn't just so much that people were starting to become anti-Catholic or questioning stuff. It was actually like a legitimate time of reckoning for the Catholic Church. And you also had the rise of, you know, all the new atheism figures. Um, yeah. What are their names? Dawkins. Yeah. <laughs> Dawkins. Richard, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris. These, yeah, all these new atheists. The unfuckables, um, I think they call them. <laughs> So, yeah, yes. I mean, we 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 absolutely need to do an episode on the new atheists because I mean Hitchens died, but all of those guys became alt right internet grifters. They all believe in race based IQ stuff now. These founding figures of rationality and whatnot. <laughs> Kyle, I like I agree. I think there was like an opening in the armor of the Catholic Church, and like it says a lot that even though they have the same plot, like, Angels and Demons, I think sold like a few thousand copies, and the Da Vinci Code blew up. And the difference is that one is published uh, before the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal came out, and then the other one is published right after. And it's a chance to take all the stakes and mysticism from Catholicism and turn it into a theme park ride. You know, it's, it's a great opportunity. You have centuries worth of myth and stories that people already know. And now you can do a choose your own adventure with all the details, you know, Mary Magdalene, the Knights Templar, Charlemagne, you just get to, to build a story out of something that like previously would have would have been considered like too sacrilege or, or not something that people like wanted to fictionalize too much. Someone once described Tom Clancy novels as take a character out, replace it with technology instead of develop 
develop characters, you get planes and drones and whatnot. And Dan Brown does the same thing, but with, yeah, weaving this tapestry web instead of, you know, uh, people feel like they're reading Wikipedia, but like only the gems. Take characterization out and replace it with Catholic mythology. The book also gives you a version of Christianity that's compatible with modern life, which I think is appealing to a lot of people. Like it's of a mortal Jesus who gets pussy. And so again, he does that leading of, of, of fact to fiction where he's like, step one is being like, oh, actually Jesus's divinity wasn't established until the Council of Nicaea. And you're like, okay, that's true. And then, you know, by the time you get to step two, it's like, oh, and but Mary Magdalene fled to France and Charlemagne is her great grandson. I just, another thing that's, that's- that's so like fascinating about this book. And an- another thing that puts it like squarely in its time period is that it is fundamentally an apolitical work. Like there's no, despite this all being about how this one conspiracy would bring down the Catholic church, it actually in no fundamental way challenges power structures at all. And that's like part of it coming around full circle at the end and Langdon just being like, eh, I guess I'll keep this to myself. <laughs> and and, and no, that, the church and that, does a lot of charity. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that being positioned, like it's, it's like a centrist novel in that way and that being positioned as like the correct and moral stance is to to have this information to be privy to it but to ha- but to be wise and self-controlled enough and to to be able to see the full picture and decide to do absolutely nothing with the information which of course in the way that centrism is always actually conservative at its core mm-hmm. and and maintaining the status quo is a conservative stance so i think that's another thing that puts it squarely in the you know the bush era 2003 status quo like don't rock the boat don't be too too liberal too right but of course just it just reifies whatever the power structures are and that's something that i don't think would fly today like if people got through a book like this which i think we'll talk about for lots of reasons just i don't think would take off if we're written now it's quaint in too many ways but the fact that it fundamentally says nothing about anything in the end is definitely a big part of it there's no sides being taken you don't actually get to like feel victorious at the end depending on which camp you're in yes yeah, so next we'll talk about the da vinci code walk so that q and could run and i think a lot of the book is, is based on clues that are hiding in plain sight and that a secret society uses symbols to indicate membership and cues which are rooted in judeo-christian ideology the comparisons to, to QAnon, or at least like the priming for something like QAnon, seem pretty apparent and again yeah. there's these like spaces with fact and fiction so it like starts off as something real where you're like oh there are elites doing pederasty and pedophilia like we saw with epstein and then you just slowly lead it into being crazy it's it's like the moment in indiana jones where he swaps the, the statue for the bag of sand that's basically what all of this is just being like yep 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 and whoop you didn't see that did you it's wild because yeah the church has suppressed this truth why like this book could have easily gone down like the church wants to accrue power the church wants money the church wants whatever but even in this absolute fantasy the church i guess just wants to gatekeep salvation they're like people can't find out that they can get salvation through the divine feminine which i mean what does that look like it was like through a sex right or something it's like unclear <laughs> unclear what they're worried about ben you made a it's- great point which is that like he goes to such great lengths to build out this insane conspiracy being done by the catholic church but like he didn't have to do that <laughs> there was already an insane conspiracy yeah. being done by the catholic church at the time and it's like oh no actually uh, I'm going to make this other case, which is in some ways less ridiculous than the real one actually that's happening. Yeah. I mean, if this book came out today, it would be entirely, it, it would somehow start with the Catholic Church and then sway into, you know, certain other religious groups that would really be the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it would be explicitly... Yeah, we're talking, we're, t- we're, t- we're talking about triple parentheses <laughs> Catholics, if you catch my meaning. <laughs> and it would explicitly be about the sex abuse scandal. But again, in, in almost the opposite phenomenon of there being something you could work with but going a different way it would somehow be about like lizard people and you know the... they're turning the frogs gay <laughs> exactly. <laughs> grooming and pizza gate and all these different things like that's the way this book would go today yeah like it say what you will about QAnon. it's very clear what they think the bad guys are doing to them right <laughs> they're poisoning you they're turning you gay they you know want to take away your guns whatever 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 new world order like it's clear what your enemies are trying to do to you you in this worldview unclear what it's like the stupid south park meme of like step two question mark step three profits for the catholic church of the da vinci code again going back to the historical context of when this came out i think another thing that all these pieces just coming together at the the right place in time is like the post 9 11 world that it came out in and i think like for a lot of people i remember hearing about like loose change and the, the conspiracies that 
you know, it's an inside job. Bush did 9-11. And I think for a lot of people, like that was, I think conspiracy theories as we now all are all too well familiar with really were not mainstream prior to 9-11. Mm-hmm. And I think that was when things started to slip into public consciousness. And like, I think a, a shocking number of people, you know, considering how close it was to the event and all the patriotism going on at the time and hoorah, invasion of Iraq, everything, there was still like a sizable amount of the American population that believed something was off about 9-11, you know, whatever it might be. And I think that's yep. the birth of conspiracy theories coming to the mainstream. And now you've got yeah. this awesome example of, whoa, it goes it goes deeper. There's more levels. Yeah, I think yeah, Kyle, thousands of years. Conspiracy theories have become so commonplace that I think, Kyle, you've told me before, in a medical setting, it can be tough sometimes to determine like what is behavior that like should be concerning and what is just like sort of a normal cultural affinity towards conspiracy theories. Like if you believe in like some of the QAnon, the crazier QAnon stuff, like is that evidence of, of some kind of um, uh, not great delusion. perception of reality of delusion? Yeah. Or, 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 or is it like, oh yeah, no, that's totally like a normal thing that like people believe JFK Jr. is still alive and like going to re- lead the reckoning. <laughs> it's yeah. going to kill all the Hollywood, all the Hollywood sickos you don't like. I mean, it's so fascinating. Like I feel like when this book came out again, like conspiracy theories are just starting to come into the mainstream and this was like a safe way to come into it, right? Like you're 13, you're 14 or you're 40, 50, whatever. And you're reading this book <laughs> and you're just starting, <laughs> you're, you're some age between one <laughs> <laughs> and, I don't know, 150. And you are a human age. <laughs> <laughs> you were born at some point prior to now. And you're reading this book and, you know, it's like a, it's, it's like a safe way to step into this world because again, fundamentally there's no real stakes in the moment. It feels like it, but it's so safe because again, by the end of the book, nothing happens, nothing fundamentally changes. But for the first time, at least for me, you have this experience of your mind expanding and I'm seeing behind the curtains. I'm, I'm understanding the, the, the strings are being pulled and, and you start to think about things in that sense. And I do think the the line between, you know, not, not this book, like, created QAnon, but the the conditions that this book thrived in, definitely there's a trail to where we're at now. And that's another thing that, again, it's so quaint that this book, the bad guys are the Catholic Church preserving, I don't know, a secret that would it even be a big deal? I don't know. And then fast forward and now the bad guys are reptiles who are replacing famous people with clones for completely <laughs> unclear reasons. And or possibly people... holograms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clones and or holograms or holographic <laughs> clones. Just to pick up on, on that point you made, Jord, about the like that line between mass delusion and culturally like subculturally normative belief like the definition of delusion roughly is basically like a a fixed belief that is you know not true not based in reality and then with some of the caveats that it also can't be in keeping with some subcultural norm so for example someone who's religious believes in god believes that when they pray god hears their prayers that's a normative belief you know even if you don't believe it you can't call that a delusion unless it can cross the line of course but but for most for the most part and that's like i actually don't know what to do or how to think about q on because if you met one person who believed like a tenth of what you know the 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 deep the people who are in deep believe you know you'd be like oh this person is psychotic (laughs) i'm very worried about this person's mental health uh but the fact that there are like i think like hundreds of thousands now of people who fundamentally believe that you know the same set of beliefs like you can't you can't label that a mass delusion or maybe you can i don't know like there's there's so little evidence supporting it but at a certain point when that many people believe it and all come together and and share that like i don't know how to think about that anymore and I, I don't know that's just where culturally where we're at that like mass delusion is now normative um, and I don't know what to say about that other than that it's not good it doesn't <laughs> bode well <laughs> Yeah. The QAnon, I think, has some of that like religious imagery that uh, the Da Vinci Code had, I think, too. Like the idea of there being like a reckoning where like the, the evil and the good will be judged for their crimes. Um, I think that there is like a tie in to the way that Da Vinci Code primed people to believe in mass conspiracies like that. Like there, there wasn't anything like 9-11. There were 9-11 conspiracies, but I feel like there, yeah, there wasn't anything as like uh, ecclesiastical about like the way they operated. It was like, oh, yeah, like people wanted to get rich or something like that. Uh, there wasn't like yeah, a secret yeah, society, like, you know, of, of like people performing rituals that involve children or anything. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, the military industrial complex wanted another big war, right? It's like a, a very, it's a wholesome, respectable conspiracy theory. Whereas now it's, yeah, they're they're turning the frogs gay. <laughs> uh, I mean, T-Bing basically walks up to the line of saying the storm is coming without saying it. <laughs> <multiple times laughs> <in this book. laughs> 
let's talk a bit for the, about the stakes because the stakes, like the, the Da Vinci Code specifically has like a feminist angle to it in a very, from a very strange angle, but it is like a, <laughs> a, what Dan Brown perceives to be a feminist, like anti fight the patriarchy angle. So the focus of the book is that the patriarchal Catholic church is trying to squash feminism by keeping hidden the information that Jesus had a kid. If people knew that Jesus got laid, then it means women are valuable or something. Like it doesn't really flesh that out. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the pretense of the book is that if people knew this information, it would change everything. I think the claim is that not only did he have a child with Mary Magdalene, but that she was actually not, she, not Peter, who for the, the you know, the real cath heads in the audience uh, <laughs> will know is, you know, uh, the, catheters. The, I, be, I believe they're called catheters. <laughs> I think they're just called Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> The real Catholics in the audience will know, you know, Peter, uh, the rock the church is built on. And I, I guess Dan Brown's point is that in actuality, Jesus was, and he literally says Jesus was something of a, the original feminist, uh, <laughs> originally intended for the church to be, for Mary Magdalene to be the one to found the church, which part of me wants to give Dan Brown credit for rolling with this, because of all the things that really weren't popular in 2003, uh, feminism wasn't one of them. This was not a high point for feminism. Like, I feel like if anything... This was like peak upswing of like what became the toxic masculinity of the mid to late aughts, like mm -hmm. the epic bacon, uh, all of that, like absolute garbage nonsense um, that would come like, oh, this is like when the Axe body spray ads were coming out. Totally. Uh, yeah. And, and like, I, I love the movies, but like, if you try to watch almost like any comedy from the 2000s, it's a different type of toxic masculinity that uh, is very foreign to now. And and you do have to give him credit. He, he, he wrote a book that had a way of promoting the, the role of women in a very unorthodox way. It, <laughs> it, 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 unorthodox. It, it wasn't of the time. I'll, we'll, we'll give yeah. them that. It, it was, it's sort of out of place. I can't think of too many other stories. If there were feminist stories, they, it would have been about a woman trying to have it all or something. <laughs> totally. <laughs> or Okay, like, but get, ca counterpoint, I'll be the devil's advocate here. His favorite exposition device is mansplaining. <laughs> 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 This is how he conveys information to the audience is Robert Langdon mansplaining to Sophie. And then at the climax, having both T-Bag and Robert Langdon mansplain to her, <laughs> nodding and confirming each other's beliefs. He's right. <laughs> He's right too. Yeah, that's, that is definitely the like hilarious counterpoint to his underlying thesis about the sacred feminine being repressed. And like, I is so in Dan Brown's mind, are women best positioned to be like necromancers or something? <laughs> just like straight up like it feels like he believes we should get we should bring witches back and that that might honestly be his opinion and there's all this like weird proto petersonian stuff like the sacred balance between male and female like it's not like vile and sexist outwardly the way that jordan peterson stuff is but it's got that same flavor of like there needs to be a balance the masculine the feminine everyone has a role uh it's so bizarre yeah no i i thought of jordan peterson all the time when he's like these these are the things you know that are feminine throughout time and, and history. Uh, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good bit, actually. So I'm going to play a game with you guys. I just found a quote, and you need to tell me if it's from the Da Vinci Code or if it's something Jordan Peterson said. Okay. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Um, men are spiritually incomplete without sex. The, the orgasm was prayer. Uh, that's Dan Brown. That's got to be Dan Brown. That's, that's got to be on the plane. <laughs> That's the, yeah, that's Dan Brown um, shortly after his divorce at your local coffee <laughs> bar. <laughs> Uh, in in the end, this this is getting back to Kyle's point about how it's like a deeply centrist book, and in like in a way that like all of art kind of was at that time. Uh, the the Priory decide to not release the information because quote the world is already moving towards feminism on its own, and it's not necessary. <laughs> and so it's like, <laughs> yep. After only two thousand years, the world is inching away from the patriarchy. <laughs> Thanks, Priory of Scion. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Da Vinci. <laughs> Fucking fuck. Another thing, like the, just like the confused gender politics of this book, it's also hard to make a, a really feminist uh, argument for it when he repeatedly, because again, everything has to come back to symbols, repeatedly points out that another constant over time is that uh, men are pointy stuff like a penis and ladies are, uh, you know, open stuff like a vagina. And that, that is the main symbolic thing that just keeps coming around and around. Is that's what we are, at the end of the day, reducible to and how important that is. Yeah. Uh, that's that's why the generals have those symbols on their coats. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, you just flip I, that upside down. Boom, you got him. <laughs> That's how ladies have ranks by those, the upside down V. Um, <laughs> yeah, the chevrons, I think, is what those are called. Okay. <laughs> nice symbolism, Ben. I am. <laughs> <laughs> By um, the way, that in 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 a Dan Brown book, you saying that would count as like a, a genius statement. <laughs> just, oh yeah, that would be an naming ab- something. That, that would be an absolute mic drop moment in the Dan Brown book. He's and right, someone would know. do a double take and be shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Another like Dan Brownism that I'm just reminded of, and one of my one of the things that would jerk me awake at night when I was trying to fall asleep <laughs> this is the term double take, <laughs> and specifically Langdon doing a double take. Uh, so I downloaded them all as audiobooks and like control find like to see how many times that specific term was used langdon does a double take four times in angels and demons <laughs> only twice in da vinci code five times in the lost symbol five times in inferno and then two times in origin <laughs> Oh my god. Okay, so let's so those are those are the big ideas for the Da Vinci Code. I, I had a couple more points about some minor ways that I think it reflected society. Um at the time in the 2000s, we had this idea of like a competent globalized national security state and Interpol in the book is presented as this hyper aware, all-knowing multinational intelligence agency. Kind of like born ultimatum vibes. All western governments work together to seek out criminal behavior and that seems archaic now. I'm like, oh, this doesn't exist. Yeah. Like man, it's like minority report they're, they're like <laughs> predicting future crimes man like they, in, in like the first chapter robert langdon's like oh yeah i forgot whatever you check into a hotel in europe they scan your passport and send it to interpol i was like what that no that's not real <laughs> Yeah, I read that and I was like, wow, and that was a thing in the 2000s. You're like, oh, computers mean uh, everything's connected now. And it's like, oh, no, it's <laughs> not how computers work. <laughs> yeah, at one point, they put out an Interpol notice to every taxi driver, which is not a thing. And there's also like, there's a thing about nerdiness that this book, like there's something to say about nerdiness in the 2000s becoming something that was aspirational for people. So I think post.com boom, there's this obsession with being a nerd. We go from having like the richest people in society be like captains of industry and finance bros to being Bill Gates type guys, right? And I think that the culture changes in a way that people embrace being a nerd. You like want to be smart. And this decade gives us comic book movies. It gives us shows like The Big Bang Theory and Dan Brown, which make you feel smart, even if the information like really isn't that high level, but it makes you feel like you're learning something. It used to be shameful to be a nerd, but now I think people wanted to like indulge in in the sensation of being like, oh, I drink and I know things. Oh, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I wish you hadn't said that. You just ruined my day. That's... <laughs> and so a few more funny things about the Da Vinci Code, just as this was like miscellaneous section here, the complete misrepresentation of French people. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the portrayal of the French is so funny because he certainly through the cops, he, he has a line where he's like, to Foch, like many Frenchmen, uh, Christianity wasn't a religion, but a birthright. It was like the most famously irreligious people in Europe, <laughs> the most rabidly Se- rabidly secular the burka banning French <laughs> <laughs> there's another line yeah in there where like Robert is considering giving himself up to the police and Sophie is like no in France the criminals don't have any rights <laughs> Like, yes, the famously anti-humanist French. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure you get, I'm pretty sure you can uh, smoke hand-rolled cigarettes and sip tiny coffees in a kitchenette in their prisons. I'm pretty sure that's how it they, they make a, a, a big point in this book about like Da Vinci being gay, which I did look up. And we have a pretty good idea that it's true. And uh, I just bring it up because it's funny because like the best piece of evidence that we have, and, like most of our, our ideas about Da Vinci being gay actually come from a rough draft that one of his students drew. And it appears to be uh, Da Vinci with like an, like an erect penis. And uh, it's pretty long, it's pretty girthy. And it's, it's a pretty nice <laughs> sketch, actually. I put it in the notes. I don't know if you guys saw it. <laughs> <laughs> but like that's always cited as being like oh why else would his student know what his dick looked like hard and it's like he must have been gay <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go into Opus Day a little bit because they had some cultural impact in the 2000s. There were people who were becoming tradcasts in the 2000s. I don't know if you guys know this, like Opus Day, so it comes from Franco of Spain. Escriva is like the guy who came up with Opus Day, and he's known for being like a Hitler apologist. And he said that Hitler has been badly treated by the world. And one of his quotes that I found, which I find very funny, was Hitler could not have been such a bad person. He couldn't have killed six million Jews. It couldn't have been more than four million. 
season. And I'm like, you're right. That does make it one third worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's how numbers work, right? <laughs> like, if you only killed four million, we're giving you one third too much uh, um, opprobium. Yeah. Um, okay, so that wraps up the book. No. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I, I do have, I have a question for you guys. What's your favorite puzzle from the book? Okay, calling them puzzles is <laughs> stretching the meaning of that word. Okay, oh, a toddler can, can complete a puzzle, I would argue, and therefore this technically counts. Yeah. Uh, I will say all of the puzzles in the Da Vinci Code are, are a thousand times better than the ones in Ancient Deep. Like, he really improves them considerably. Um, probably the Cryptex. I don't know, like, it's, it's a hacked answer, but the Apple, there is a lot in that symbol the apple one i think was perfectly calibrated i mean none of them are difficult but that one was perfectly calibrated to feel a little challenging and for most readers i think to get the answer before the book reveals it and give you that that rush of dopamine of being like ha i'm as smart as robert langdon it's so yeah. frustrating that robert langdon can't get the answer to that one considering how good he is at getting all the other obscure clues like he knows like which churches were built by bernini but this motherfucker can't <laughs> guess apple about Isaac Newton. <laughs> this guy, this guy has anagrams at the, <laughs> yes. at the tips of his fingers. He's like, oh, draconian devils. It's obviously Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> oh, Ben, he's got an eidetic memory, something that is referenced <laughs> 1,000 times. Uh, I'm not seeing any planets that shouldn't be here. Uh... <laughs> I, I and the I think the worst the worst puzzle quote unquote in the whole thing is the moment when they're on the plane and he's puzzling over what is this 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 language I'm familiar with so many languages it looks vaguely Semitic what is it I can't identify it he has a French uh, literal cryptographer with him she can't identify it boom figures it out it's backwards <laughs> <laughs> just cursive writing backwards oh painful yeah uh, how many Every, weeks I think it Every book has to have at least one absolutely garbage puzzle. Yeah, I mean, the way they get to the bank, just it, that's like one of those things where it's like, oh, I guess they got lucky. Hold on. There's one last quote from the book about that scene where they're trying to figure out how to get to the bank and he figures it out because it's a it's a stout cross instead of a long and narrow cross. And those crosses have different symbol symbological meanings. Okay, here it is. Uh, it looks Christian, the cross. <laughs> Sophie, Sophie pressed. <laughs> this kind of cross carried none of the Christian connotations of crucifixion fiction associated with the longer stemmed Latin cross originated by Romans as a torture device. Langdon was always surprised how few Christians who gazed upon the crucifix realized their symbol's violent history was reflected in the very name. Cross and crucifix come from the Latin verb cruciare to torture. Yeah, they know it's a torture device if they go to church <laughs> once. Like, how can you look at the, the body hanging on the cross and not realize that? The thing, like, yeah, the thing famously in any Catholic church. Yeah. <laughs> A <laughs> uh, few people knew that the <laughs> cross was a torture device. <laughs> it's like it's the main story. <laughs> Yeah, that's not subtext, Robert Langdon. That's just the text. There's no sub. It just is what it is. It is the thing. Yeah, it's it's a book ostensibly about symbolism with literally no underlying symbolic readings of its own. Yeah, yeah. There was a discussion on Reddit about that. People were like, "Oh, there has to be some kind of like secret message. Like if you you know if you put like the first letters of the chapter, and it's like no, like they, 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 there's no one is trying." to do anything more than what's on the surface. Right, well, let's get into the discussion of the movie. Um, it's dog shit. It's so dog unwatchable. Shit. Ben and I, like, we couldn't get through it. It's also like two and, two and a half hours long. What um, a snore. Everyone is phoning it in because it's just a payday. Everyone's like sick. This movie's going to make money. We don't have to do anything. And one of the parts that, that, that's actually enjoyable, about, as much as we make fun of like the dumb like Wikipedia-ness of the book, that stuff, it is entertaining to read. Like you do feel like you're learning a little bit. It's just, it's so much more awkward in a movie context because he has to say it out loud for the audience to hear it in the book it's great because like he just thinks it right but in the book he has to be like ah did you know <laughs> and there's like a dead body on the ground and he's like ah the tiles are arranged in such a way it's the pairing of those two pyramids it's it's unique the two are geometric echoes fascinating and, and the movie is dumbed down like one more level even from where the book is at. So you can imagine like the level of the fun fact. He explains something and I'll, I'll put it in here, but it's essentially like the, the, the Mon Simpsons monorail joke. 
in Latin, sub rosa. Literal translation. Beneath the rose. So then, mono means one, and rail means rail. Yeah, and because Tom Hanks is phoning it in so hard, and because this, the, the adapted screenplay is so lazy, when he drops these fun facts, it's like, oh, no, you have Asperger's. You're on the <laughs> spectrum somewhere. Like... Yeah, it, it does change the picture when he has to say it out loud in the middle of... It really implies that at no point does Robert Langdon appreciate the seriousness and gravity of the situations <laughs> going on around him. Like a man is bled out in front of him, arranged his body, did the pentacle, the whole thing, and he's there just spouting cold facts as if he's completely <laughs> oblivious to how bad this is. Yeah. Ironically, Robert Langdon, Harvard symbologist, his pattern recognition is suspect. <laughs> he's, not, he's not really appreciating the situation. I was I was getting angry, not angry, I was getting upset with you guys before we started recording today, because before we were recording, you started going off on fun facts, and I told you that, like, it's like you're Robert Langdon and there's a corpse on the floor, because you're just like, ah, did you know that I got divorced? <laughs> <laughs> it's like dude there's, there's a guy who, who's like naked on the floor bleeding from the stomach <laughs> and what what i find pretty funny is that it is a pretty faithful adaptation of the book including all the multiple pov character plot lines leaving. that's why it's so dang long they didn't deviate from their source material it was like let's craft this thing out and get paid movies take a long time to make like pre-production development editing blah 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 blah. this book came out in 03 and the movie came out in 06 they were like getting this thing made and i think this is also a, a sign of what was to come where hollywood studios now realize people don't want new things people want their comfy security blanket so this is why they're making movies about like they made the battleship board game into a movie <laughs> find intellectual property that already exists and just milk every teat on that cash cow and, and again they're scraping the bottom of the barrel because they've done every major comic book movie uh that there is they've done transformers they've done battleship i think there's a hot wheels movie in pre-production so we can get a whole hasbro cinematic universe going <laughs> <laughs> but because movies cost so much to make, Hollywood doesn't want to take a risk on something that they'll have to market, on something new, on novelty. And uh, you can definitely see the beginnings of that phenomenon in the 2000s. I listened to an interview with the screenwriter and he he was describing how like, he was like, oh, you know, I read it. And I was like, oh, it's I could write it really easily because so much of the book was already dialogue. And I was like, you know, you're not like, it's, it's two different art forms. <laughs> you can't just copy and paste the dialogue. <laughs> well, when you're a master of the written word like Dan Brown <laughs> is. It really transcends these generic boundaries. I've never seen Tom Hanks like phone in a role. Like he, he generally tries hard in, in everything he does. You know, you know, think of him what you want, but like, you know, even if you don't like the movie, uh, what was it? Like Charlie Wilson's War or, or uh, When Bridge of Spies or something. Like he does seem to take the effort to, to inhabit the character and there's just none of that in this movie. He's just reading the line. I feel like day one they spun him around in the, the makeup chair. He saw his wig and went, oh, it's this <laughs> kind of production <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that hair piece it's it's glorious it's it's wavy locks they could have chosen that's how wigs work you can choose anything <laughs> It's, it's such a perplexing choice to make the main character, who, as we'll talk about, he goes to great lengths to get across just how, like, ruggedly handsome he is. Oh, yeah. Uh, unpleasant to look at. <laughs> it's a visual medium. <laughs> Yeah, Tom Hanks, actually, I don't know if you guys know this, Tom Hanks had to do this movie in order to make enough money to buy N-word passes for Chet. Uh, okay, so Angels and Demons, as discussed, it's 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 a prior version. So he wrote it first. It's, it's actually, and in the movies, they retcon it to actually be the sequel. But And most people, I think, read it second. Um, thankfully, you don't really need to know anything about the plot because it's written by a master author. Um, but it's a much rougher version of the first. It, it, it's a cookie-cutter reproduction. There's been a murder. Robert Langdon is called in to solve it. The person murdered is a scientist at CERN, and Robert Langdon has to team up with, surprise, surprise, his daughter to find the killer. The murdered scientist <laughs> uh, was also a priest and was creating antimatter in an effort to bridge the divide between science and religion. The body's been branded with the Illuminati symbol, and the Illuminati are a secret society that has existed for hundreds of years to keep science safe from the Catholic Church. They've hired an assassin to steal the antimatter and turn it into a bomb, which 
they're going to destroy the Vatican City with. This is all happening during the election of a new pope, and Robert and the scientist's daughter, Vittoria, have to follow clues to catch the, the assassin as he murders, murders cardinals around Rome. Um, I could go on describing the plot, but <laughs> it's not worth it. Suffice to say, it ends with Robert Langdon flying the antimatter bomb a couple of miles into the sky so that it can detonate, and him jumping out of the helicopter into the Tiber River in Rome. So let's see, why did it reflect 2000s culture? The, I mean, the biggest point here, I think, is the whole point of the book was can science and religion coexist, right? There were a lot more like, religious morality debates happening in the 2000s than there were now. I remember people talking about like, is, is cloning ethical? Stem cells, like that's George Bush's presidency that was trying to solve that. Can, should evolution be taught in schools? Is genetic engineering okay? Uh, yeah, like, kids today will, will, will not have heard of Dolly the sheep, uh, despite no. us all having to learn way too much about that sheep uh, in the late 90s. <laughs> Did we just did we just stop cloning? Did we, did, was this like when we went to the moon and we were like, okay, we're good, we did it. Let's move on to the next thing. Let's... I think we stopped caring. <laughs> well, the morality debate Are was we... like, yeah, like can should we clone? You know, then who who made the soul? Is it us or God? And one thing that's changed a lot. I feel like in the two thousands, like George Bush, like he, he was like a religious president, right? Born again, definitely the, the last one that we've ever had, and that is just no longer important. After we elected Obama, I feel like it, it didn't become an issue in an election anymore. Like whether or not someone believed in God. It was like, oh yeah, like they'll posture to it or something, but it's, it's not going to become like a, a tenet of how they make decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Obama famously like jettisoned his preacher when Jeremiah Wright, like uh, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright had his like uh, his little tapes come out where he called 9-11, the chickens coming home to roost. And uh, Obama just immediately jettisoned him. He didn't you jettison know, him. He was serious. Right. That was the point of what he's like. I I, I, I can't do it. I, I, I can't uh, jettison him the same way I can't jettison my grandmother, yeah. my white grandmother. I thought he I thought he stopped going to that church when it became a thing. Oh, okay. He may have done that, but his public statement was like, I can't disown him the same way that I can't disown my white grandmother. Mm, and yeah, classic Obama. Thread the needle. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, he's I also remember way back in the day reading a think piece where when he did that stupid American thing where you list groups of people, it's like, oh, I'm gonna be a president for all Americans. <laughs> Old, young, black, white, the religious, and the atheists. Like he was like one of the first presidents to include non-believers. He's in the his, A-word. Yeah, in, in his in his catalog of demographics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so yeah, I think that's like, that's where it like kind of started happening. But yeah, it's, I don't know, Trump famously like, tried to talk to some evangelicals and he got the name of the book of the Bible wrong. He's like, as it says in two Corinthians <laughs> instead of second Corinthians. And Biden's like, you know, famously Irish Catholic, but literally outside of St. Patrick's Day, I, I'm not sure that <laughs> seems to be a thing he talks about. Yeah, religion could, it's like part of your like, like ethnic identity, but, but it's, yeah, it's not something that like drives your thinking, but except that, I mean, what, when we're saying that as a, this is how the 2000s was different from today. And like this book makes more sense in the 2000s because like this debate was happening and, it, and it's hard for someone who wasn't alive at that time to, to think about like, oh, like this was important to, to debate, not just amongst like left wing versus right wing, but I mean, like actually in your family, like is cloning okay or something? I, well, we went from uh, debating uh, is cloning ethically, morally acceptable to, again, a large swath of the population just implicitly believing that most celebrities are clones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being like, yep. Um, and the so you times know, like, they it's, are a change. <laughs> like, believe it or not, so Origin, his most recent novel, 2017, is even more than Angels and Demons about the battle between religion and science. It's that is explicitly what the book is about. Again, he it, it ends with him hits. taking. But again, that book nobody gave a shit about it. No, no impact. By the time it comes out, 2017, not a debate that interests people at all. Also. The this like this binary opposition between science and religion i feel like you see it in other places in the 2000s decade and i think it's very funny because religion is an ideology it's like ideological glasses that colors how you see the world but science isn't you don't science is a method right it's like a, a scientific method of understanding even like the the frame of the debate is wrong these are like two different categories but you see this in lost too where they would have one character who represents the man of science the one who represents the man of faith you know the whole new atheism movement like really cashed in on this binary of things that they present as totally mutually exclusive when they're not even necessarily the same type of thing mm -hmm. yeah. okay well we better keep it moving i guess i just wanted to talk about the assassin character the 
Janus. <laughs> the Hassassin. I, I, the Hashashin, yes. <laughs> okay, I couldn't figure this out because at first I was like, oh, this is the perfect villain for the 2000s because it's like, you know, a, a Muslimic assassin bent on like the destruction of the Western religion. But then I thought about it and I was like, actually, this was chosen as the villain pre-9-11. But I, after 9-11, when they made the movie, is they recast this role as like a white Christian guy. And I, I think there was a, like a PMC backlash against having Muslim villains. It seemed like that that's the only reason I can think of it, for them, like not for to them changing that character in the movie. Uh, so I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? I couldn't quite figure out like, may, I don't think maybe we weren't villainizing Arabic people in, in the way that I thought. I assumed we would have. It, it wasn't all the Jeff Dunham show. Yeah, I think that that clash of civilizations between East and West or whatever, you definitely see it in some pieces of pop culture from the decade, like most famously with something like 300, definitely cashes in on this like barbarous Easterner versus Western civilization narrative, but it's not as prevalent as you would think it might be, it, at least on the pop culture side of things. I think the reason for that is probably just the banal answer that Hollywood's filled with libs. <laughs> that's that's all it is. Right. Uh, and I think partially it's, um, you know, Robert Langdon, it's the centrism, right? It's, you don't want to, you don't want to actually be controversial. You don't want to actually say anything of substance or value, potentially. You want to, you want to avoid that risk. So, mm, okay. So, um, so my, I, my theory mm-hmm. on why the, uh, the, the main bad guy is the Hassassin is purely so that Robert Langdon can explain the etymology of the word. Hassassin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is, uh, did you know that Hashashin <laughs> comes from the word hash, which they would smoke? <laughs> we add Ewan McGregor to the cast. He's pretty cool. But again, everyone is phoning it in. Everyone is just getting paid. They can get good and actors because they know it's going to make a billion dollars. I'll say the other, like you, you had mentioned that, you know, Angels and Demons is a bit of a dry run for what becomes the Da Vinci Code and the puzzles get better and et cetera, et cetera. And I remember having also read Da Vinci Code first, Angels and Demons second. I, I remember like really early on within the first couple of chapters, Robert Langdon gets the facts and it's got the, uh, the Illuminati logo which is an ambigram you can read it forwards you can read it backwards it's the same and I remember like even when I was 13 being like this is kind of weak <laughs> because I think I think Robert Langdon's response is like something along the lines of this isn't possible like <laughs> as if like the implication is that only the true Illuminati would be capable of producing a word word art that could be read forwards and backwards the same. That, that's literally the implication and then it happens like six more times in the book like ambigrams really have a big focus in the book and i remember like even as a 13 year old being like okay this this isn't as good the illuminati were very dedicated to the hard science of graphic design <laughs> keeping it safe from the catholic church I, I have one quote about the assassin that i just want to make sure that i get in because it's so great um and it just it, we'll put this in the bucket of like dan brown is is like he hasn't refined his, his writing yet and so this is this is the assassin character um he's just killed someone and now he's rewarding himself at a brothel okay Uh, he positioned the photo album on his lap. His people did not celebrate Christmas, but this must be what Christmas morning felt like. A lifetime of sexual fantasy stared back at him. Marissa, an Italian goddess. Fiery, a young Sophia Loren. Shachiko, a Japanese geisha. Light, no doubt skilled. Tanara, a stunning black vision. Muscular, exotic. You have expensive taste, Jeez. the madam said. I should be, he thought. I am a connoisseur. <laughs> <laughs> God. The Hashashin yeah. padded the length of the hall uh, like a panther anticipating a long overdue meal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should have warned everyone. If you're listening to this pod while driving, be warned. You might get too turnt <laughs> from, what, from what's about from what we're about to read, and or have a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> I encourage everyone to just take a quick glance in the mirror. You're gonna want to make sure your smile is symmetrical. <laughs> in his ogling of women, in his attempt to describe their hotness, he just resorts to racial stereotypes. Yes. Right? Like, yes. One of the one of them is a gay show one of them is primal it's like oh no he's, <laughs> he's, he got so turned he went racist <laughs> I have another, there's like a men writing women aspect to the, the Dan Brown's writing as well, especially in this one, like Vittoria. Uh, there's a subreddit called Men Writing Women where like they take parts of books where it's about women, but it's like clearly written by a man. So this quote I have here, the context is that Vittoria, her father has been murdered. His body is on the floor with his eye missing. <laughs> she is seeing this for the first time. And this is the description that Dan Brown gives of Vittoria. 
Vittoria Vetra looked nothing like the physicist he expected. She was tall with chestnut skin, long black hair that swirled in the wind. Her face was unmistakably Italian, not overly beautiful, but possessing earthy features that even at 20 yards seemed to exude a raw sensuality. As the air currents buffeted her body, the clothes clung, accentuating her slender torso and small breasts. <laughs> she is CERN's resident guru of yoga. Yoga, Langdon thought. The ancient art of Buddha seemed like a strange pastime for a Catholic daughter of a physicist priest. Her skin was radiant, or was a radiant tone that enjoyed long hours in the sun. And I'm reading this going, her father's body is on the floor. <laughs> His eye is missing. And you're talking about how small her tits are. Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> That's, he, he's got, like, again, another weird, like, relic of, like, 2000s. He nags. There's every yes, woman yes. he introduces gets is nagged it's always like good quality good quality good quality but <laughs> the rest of it it's completely unhinged the way he describes and introduces every single female and he doesn't do that with robert langdon at all no he never gets nagged but yeah. also like the closest the, the closest Brown... he comes is saying he's 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 not classically handsome but then he the next sentence refers to him as harrison ford in tweed so <laughs> oh. okay yeah i also have a Robert Langdon description of women passage. This is when he meets Sophie in the Da Vinci Code. Langdon turned to see a young woman approaching. Dressed casually, she was attractive. It looked to be about 30. Her thick burgundy hair fell unstyled to her shoulders. Unlike the wayfish cookie cutter blondes that adorned Harvard dorm room walls, this woman was healthy with an un unembellished beauty and genuineness that radiated a striking personal confidence. Nag, nag, nag. <laughs> And like, what hey, I, I couldn't help but notice it. your, um, how should I put it? Unembellished beauty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, her father figure is is <laughs> like tangled up like off-season Christmas lights naked on the floor. <laughs> right. Again. <laughs> again. Hey, honey, Ridden. you ever think about uh, embellishing yourself? Yeah, it could really help. <laughs> My favorite little aside is that Robert Langdon is patrolling the Harvard dorm rooms, looking at the posters of women on the dude's walls. I'm just imagining him like, how do you do, fellow budding symbologists? <laughs> yeah, classic so, Harvard I, I, undergrad, by <laughs> to have a picture of uh, Pamela Anderson up on the wall. <laughs> he goes to great lengths to explain that uh, Langdon has, in fact, uh, won a place amongst the Harvard undergrads because of his cool, laid-back, sporty nature. Uh, so he actually actually does spend a lot of time uh red flag red flag uh, socializing <laughs> with the young athletes at harvard <laughs> it talks a lot do? about uh, <laughs> his athletic body being able to uh, overpower an entire team of water polo players <laughs> in the pool right yeah i mean the amount of times how, that he how, how do you do fellow you <laughs> The amount of times that he fights off Janice in this book is is like he's like, well, uh, I I have played water polo. <laughs> it's like, this guy murders like half of the Roman police, <laughs> and it's like he can't kill Langdon because he played water polo. <laughs> well, dude, he does fifty laps a day, <laughs> which again referenced oh. every opportunity possible. Yeah, he has a swimmer's body. He's hot. Um, by the way, that yoga like. Uh, what's her favorite? Victoria uses yoga to get like in like one of the ultimate action sequences in the book. She uses her yoga to, to you know, Harry Houdini did yoga. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like what what a dumb observation. Can a good Catholic girl do yoga? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe there was like a little bit of this undercurrent in the early 2000s of like yoga is Eastern. And it, it had a there, religious but... context, probably a little bit more than today. Yeah, yeah. But Giordano, yeah. What, what's the explanation? I, for, I can't remember, but like Robert Langdon has about three qualities, like three character traits. And one of them is his uh, Mickey Mouse watch. Right. What's the story behind it? <laughs> that rugged well, it gets him out of a lot of jams it. because it glows in the dark. <laughs> It's no, he explains that he, uh, Mickey, uh, Walt Disney was his, uh, wrote so many symbols into the work. He's, you know, he's the uh. original symbologist. It, it's his earliest memory of seeing deeper meanings behind symbols. It's associated with Mickey Mouse. Great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I regret asking. <laughs> it's, it's, 
somehow less interesting than I expected. Oh, yeah. No, but then he goes on a big cataloging list of all of the symbols of Disney movies about the divine feminine in The Little Mermaid. Again, strong Jordan Peterson vibes mm-hmm. uh, in that particular passage. I, I One of the points about uh, Angel of Demons that I love is he's very worried about ruining historical records. Like at the end of the book, he's really upset. He's like, ah, oh, uh, uh, the, the diagramma had been ruined by by my fall. Meanwhile, he like, <laughs> like destroyed like the entire the entire Vatican archive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> he pushes over the bookcases and like they all like fall over like dominoes and he's like ah i had gotten the diagramma wet and i couldn't forgive myself <laughs> yeah he not only does he knock them all over but he like destroys like the air preservation system that keeps <laughs> yes. them from these like ancient texts from crumbling he ruins that too <laughs> Yeah, can, uh, what can you tell us about like the other books, like the other Robert oh. Langdon books? Oh, um, the one after Da Vinci Code is, lost, is The Lost Symbol. And that one takes place in Washington, in and around Washington, D.C. The secret society du jour in that book is, of course, the Masons. Mm-hmm. Um, hey, uh, Giordano here coming in on the edit. Kyle went on in excruciating detail for over 25 minutes describing the plot of each of the Dan Brown novels. And we got a little manic because Kyle's summary was like a piece of performance art. It went on so long. We saw time fold on itself. The symbols came too fast. So I'm cutting it out. It's just, it's not suitable for publication. Also, uh, the Illuminati asked me to take it out. So I have to. I'm sorry. That's all the time we have for today. <laughs> the year 2017. I, no, I just I do have a few things I have to say. I'm, I've muted Kyle, man. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let him unmute himself. If you okay. promise to be good and not spread his brain parasite to us. <laughs> so, no, I think, I think honestly, the main... The, the, I just want to say a few, <laughs> some absolutely. The, the, Thus the ends of- my prepared remarks. <laughs> like off the cuff about the you can cut three Robert Langdon first You can cut all this. I just, the brilliant woman <laughs> who's with him has the realization. And I quote, Robert, Edmund didn't choose page 163 because of the painting. What do you mean? There's nothing else on page 163. It's a clever decoy. You've lost me. Edmund chose page 163 because it's impossible possible to display that page without simultaneously displaying the page next to it page 162 <laughs> that's the big that's one of the big reveals is oh, that come on man it's just it's just the other page uh, and that's where the line is the other frankly brain melting moment so at one point a car gets away a camera catches a glimpse of the car's windshield the ai program who is the running character in this one that speaks to him in his ear the U-shaped sticker on top, Langdon said, is a different symbol entirely. The getaway car was hired, Langdon said, pointing to the stylized U on the windshield. And this is literally the chapter ending cliffhanger. It's an Uber. <laughs> Next chapter, of course, chapter cut. From the look on the wide-eyed disbelief on Fonseca's face, Langdon couldn't tell what surprised the agent more. The quick decryption of the windshield sticker, again, the Uber logo, or Admiral Avila's odd choice of getaway car. One of the main puzzles come down to him identifying the Uber logo on a windshield. <laughs> In 2017, Uber was founded in 2009 and was in oh, yeah. Canada by 2015. <laughs> He's lost touch with reality like Jerry Seinfeld. You know, you know when Jerry Seinfeld was like, what's the deal with Uber? Who's driving? Is anyone paying for these things? <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to cut all of that. But oh. it's just like, that's, that's the decline that happens over these books. He also, he also uses the term Gulfstream G550, which is the name of the jet he keeps flying around in eight times in this novel. <laughs> God, he loves talking about the planes and shit uh, that he's on. Yeah, that's that's that, that probably comes down to the, the number of model of trains in his house. 
I, 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 I put together a Dan Brown plot generator. So he really has like the best life, I think, because I decided to like write the plot of a, of a Dan Brown book and it took about five minutes. So let me know how close <laughs> it seems to, to the original. So I've called this book a mandate of heaven. Okay. Robert Langdon is awoken in the middle of the night at Belmore Castle's Royal Suite. He was sent to give a speech at Oxford University about the hidden pederastic symbology behind Stonehenge. And did you know that the term henge shares a root word with the word hang? Few people know that they're making reference to a hanging whenever they talked about Stonehenge, or even realize the similar shapes that Stonehenge had to the hanging gallows. He's told that there is an urgent message from Scotland Yard, which was not a yard, but actually a reference to the former park in which the police stations at that entrance used to sit on. <laughs> The chief raven master of the yeoman's warders, which are the people who guard England's crown jewels, shows Robert Langdon to the missing crown jewels, and they've been replaced by the naked body tattooed in Celtic scriptures. The body is hanging from a Stonehenge-like shape in the Tower of London, and it's the body of the Viscount of Severn, fifth in line to the British royal throne. There's a note from the Knights of Columbus <laughs> that the monarchy's royal line <laughs> will be killed in descending order until a Catholic slash Celtic monarch, not a German one, is returned to the throne in order for England to return to its Catholic Celtic roots. The niece of the murdered royal, <laughs> Princess Ingrid Johansman, a Danish woman who's 30th in line to the throne, is called in. She's an archaeologist and discovers from the tattoos the rest of the royal family members are being held hostage at England's mythical round table. So they set off... <laughs> <laughs> they set off to the temple on Little St. James Island to find the last known whereabouts of the next potential victim, Prince Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> However, Robert Langdon, a noted expert who's published a podcast on the Jeffrey Epstein mythology, once news has uh, has been revealed that he's been allowed to visit the island, a shadowy figure known only as Crooked Hillary seeks to end the investigation before it begins to unravel the secrets of Little St. James Island. So now Robert must avoid the wrath of both Hillary's agents and the Knights of Columbus to save the British royal family before only a Catholic is left in line for the throne. I love it. <laughs> it's <laughs> eerily... <laughs> I'm like, man, this guy has the best life. You, you just like, you're like, you just riff a bunch of this shit together. And so let's, let's just quickly wrap up by talking about Dan Brown's writing style, which, which we've already mostly covered. But I think we've talked about like the stakes. That's why it was so easy to write this fake story. Cause it's like, oh, what are the highest stakes you can think of? The queen of England. You just can just go to a million. It's like, I don't know if you guys ever saw that Michael Scott movie, like the Michael Scarn <laughs> office movie. It's like, it's like that where it's <laughs> yes. like the president is in danger and I have to save him. He's writing such a, a child's story it has the weakest characters of i think any novel like i've ever read like if, if i was like describe sophie never like describe her character <laughs> traits. all of that the books are entirely plot driven there, there's no character <laughs> study at all it doesn't help that one of the few adjectives he used to describe her is unembellished <laughs> <laughs> That's a non-descriptor. That's, that's the absence of a descriptor. Yeah, actually, since we're talking about style, I want to read a few quotes that I pulled up from other authors that you might know. So this is like literary criticism on Jan Dan Brown from the time it was around. And what's funny is like, it did have some positive reviews for being what it is, like a shitty beach read thriller, keep the pages turning, right? There's like, whatever, this is a quote from the San Francisco Chronicle that says, this story has so many twists, all satisfying, most unexpected, that it would be a sin to reveal too much of the plot in advance. Let's just say that if the novel doesn't get your pulse racing, you need to check your meds. When you hear what actual authors said, we have Salman Rushdie said in a lecture, do not start me on the Da Vinci Code. A novel so bad, it gives bad novels a bad name. <laughs> we have Stephen Fry. He called it, referred to Brown's writing as, quote, complete loose stool water <laughs> and, quote, arse <laughs> gravy of the worst kind. <laughs> oh, oh my God. God damn. Um, finally, we have Stephen King. Again, not a literary genius here. <laughs> Stephen King, he's crapping out books all the time. <laughs> you know, ooh, the scary cell phone, the kill phone, <laughs> or whatever. That's... <laughs> He actually has a book about scary cell phones. Um, Stephen King likened Dan Brown's work to, j quote, jokes for the John, calling such literature the, quote, intellectual equivalent of Kraft macaroni and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> as, as your dad would say, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> 
one thing that I think made reading or listening to all the books more enjoyable was doing it through the lens of like trying to understand at a deep level Dan Brown's psychology and what is going on in Dan Brown's mind in real life. Because Robert Langdon is like, I, I don't know if I've read a book where it is so obvious that the main character is just like a thinly veiled projected fantasy of the author themselves uh, in a way that is hilarious. So Dan Brown, uh, school teacher, uh, on the back cover of the Da Vinci Code is wearing a turtleneck and a Harris Tweed jacket. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and of course, at every possible description of Robert Langdon, he is not just a teacher. He's a professor at Harvard. And he's not just a professor at Harvard, but he is the most adored professor of all time. Every single description that involves him teaching or involving any mention of students, they are in a way that is impossible they are enraptured <laughs> by him <laughs> like they they hang oh, on and, every and word it is insane levels of wish fulfillment which i think is one fun little deviation in the movie where tom hanks has to decide about how oh i wish i wouldn't have got wrapped up in this adventuring i you know i could have written my book and it would have sold dozens of copies in the harvard bookstore so like <laughs> the movie is at least like yeah he's like an ivory tower academic no one's reading his shit whereas the books are like all of the students love him he's handsome <laughs> He has a puff piece written about how he is uh, that talks about his chocolatey voice. <laughs> yeah, so because I, I I took some choice quotes from the Da Vinci Code's like description of the lecture that he gives. So the students are uh, nodding enthusiastically, and then the way he's introduced: this forty-something academic has more than his share of scholarly allure. His captivating presence is punctuated by an unusually low baritone speaking voice, which his female students describe as chocolate for the ears, <laughs> which. Let's take that literally. <laughs> Why would you want chocolate in your ears? <laughs> it's, such, it's such a bizarre turn of phrase. It's because it's he's never it's... more awkward than when he has to like describe, because like, you know, Robert Langdon is on the spectrum to some extent. And if, if the author is a reflection of that, that means that like whenever he has to describe like the sexuality of, of Robert Langdon, like he gets, that's when he's most awkward. It's, it's almost impossible to read. Like the ending of Angel and demons oh my god <laughs> but he wants it both ways he wants like all the sex appeal of indiana jones but for a guy with like no sauce famously like, all of like the women in they always are the ones to hit on him in the book you know they always have to they, mm-hmm. the, the books both of them and spoiler alert i'm announcing a spoiler alert now with like him sitting like on the bed in a hotel room and the girl be like robert is there something you want to do with me <laughs> and he's like ah, <laughs> all right you can tell me about uh tuna fish again uh, i heard uh <laughs> you disproved Einstein using them <laughs> and the, she and the woman has to be like come on you can't think of anything and like that's <laughs> how both books end yes it's true <laughs> they are wildly considering every plot necessitates like in the in the five books or whatever each one features one of the top five hottest women they're just spread out through the books uh they are completely sexless it's and again it's all the more fascinating when you consider that it is a fantasy projection of himself and that's how he writes him. He chooses to make his main character completely oblivious to the advances of women mm-hmm. and just completely sexless. It's so bizarre. And it's like, I'm just so fascinated by what Dan Brown must be like in real life. Yeah. <laughs> also, I, I, I don't want to like focus too much on this, but in terms of chocolate for the ears, why would you want it or whatever? It's like, this is my boy's first attempt at a simile or metaphor in his <laughs> life. And he just whips. <laughs> like, he, <laughs> <laughs> the ball was on a tee and he whiffed it. <laughs> Not a big imagery guy. <laughs> When he describes Robert Langdon as being hot, like it really takes you out of it. In Angels and Demons, so Gunther Glick's videographer, <laughs> when she sees Robert Langdon like on a camera like, zooming in on a crowd, she does a double take where she's like, oh my God, that's the hottest guy I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, it's one of five double takes in that book, actually. <laughs> Closing thoughts, uh, be happy. If you were a Zoomer listener who is listening and curious, be happy you didn't live through this time period. <laughs> mm-hmm. Be happy you didn't read this as a young person yeah it's it's like so many other pieces of art that are crazily consumed i don't know i like i've always wondered what makes certain pieces of art something that stay with the cultural context people think about them again and they revisit them and then other pieces of art are like tiger king or something where it's like oh yeah you just like everybody does it and then you just it just passes
is right through you. I don't know. I don't really have an elegant closing thought. I just I had a lot of fun talking about this. I had, <laughs> reading it sucked. <laughs> reading it was just a, a horrible way to spend my night last night. Like the only thing that saved me was like the idea that I'm gonna meet with my friends later and talk about, this. and that's why this is enjoyable. The fact that Kyle, like a psychopath, <laughs> was doing it independently, not in, first of all, you can't. I, I was trying to bring this up. Like while I was reading the books, I would talk to friends or like I'd be on a date with someone and I'd be like nobody wants to hear about it <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I have a year's worth of data to back up the facts in, in a, a funny like parallel life imitating art you can't bring up these books without sounding like Robert Langdon until the next papal election there won't be an opportunity to bring it up organically you cannot bring up Robert Langdon in casual conversation and have it go well for you thank god we made a <laughs> podcast episode about it <laughs> <laughs> So then, mono means one, and rail means rail.